5.15 American Standard Time. The day end rushes on as homebound workers throng the streets of every city, town, and hamlet. The Jane and John Doe's of the workaday world. All of them made kin by thoughts of home and that looking ahead to dinner gleam in their eyes. Out at the other end of town, it's hustle and bustle time, too. The climax of the day for Mrs. Housewife as she whips up the victuals for a family that will soon be in from work and play. Tubby tore Dorothy's dress today. Oh, I don't suppose he meant to. Yes, he did, and he asked they at the school for it. Nearly through, dear? You just know it's getting close to nosebag time, for here comes the star border. Nothing could have torn Junior away from that sandlot ball game but an empty inner boy hollering for help. Hello, son. Hello, Mom. Here, here. None of that. What you got for dinner, Mom? This Junior is a roast of lamb. Boy, it sure smells good. Now run along and get ready for dinner, son. Oh, gee. Your father will be here any minute. And he's hungry. Okay. And does Mary Butler know her appetite appeal? It's Del Monte Early Garden Peas tonight. And when those succulent green gems go on the table as a partner to that roast, well, can't you just smell a dinner fit for a king? How about the baseball game come out today, son? Well, we beat the sluggers three to nothing. You did? Make any home runs? I made one. Good. Can I have some more, Dad? What? Got a regular man-sized appetite tonight, son. Well, I've been doing man-sized work. <laughs> you mean chasing that baseball around the sandlot? Well, it makes you awfully hungry. Back to start helping, Daddy. So what? You've had two. Now, now, children. There's plenty for everyone. Daddy, did you have peas like this when you were little? Well, yes, Lynn, we had peas that tasted just like these. Only not as often as you do. Why not? Well, we had to wait until they were in season. I used to go out in the garden and pick them fresh for dinner. Daddy, how do peas grow? On a vine, stupid. Don't you know anything? That's enough, Junior. Finish your dinner. I mean, how do they get in the can? You really want to know? Uh-huh. Well, I'll tell you. After dinner, We'll get the big wonder book and I'll tell you the whole story. Well, how's Daddy's little girl tonight, huh? Well. That's good. That's it. No, this isn't a page. Here it is. You know, when I was a boy, we had a small vegetable garden not far from the kitchen door. When peas were in season, Mother used to send me out to pick them. She and your Aunt Carrie used to shell them by hand. But nowadays, think how much easier it is. Why, we can have fresh peas any day in the year, grown especially for canning on great farms like this. Down below, hedged around by a checkerboard of golden grain fields and yellow-green corn, are the pea fields of the Midwest, part of America's great pea-growing region. Much of this fertile soil, as in other favored pea regions, is now farmed by Del Monte, clan planted to bring each field to perfection in proper succession, that canning may continue in full swing rhythm throughout the season. Here, during the Black Hawk War, a trio of famous men Abraham Lincoln, Zachary Taylor, and Jefferson Davis gathered together in council on a piece of land now farmed by Del Monte. 
who could have foreseen in that distant hour that the rolling prairies of Illinois would one day become this lush green garden? In the towns that dot the countryside, breathes a social and economic life that hinges on the harvest and canning of vegetables for the market baskets of the world. As the season nears, conversation on every hand turns to one major question. How's the pack this year? For when the pods are well filled and the harvest heavy, there's work for everyone and community prosperity. From the surrounding fields, endless truckloads of peas, harvested just at the instant nature says ready, converge on big canneries like this one, located at strategic points wherever the peas grow best. Long before the vines in the fields poked their tendrils above ground, Del Monte field men were busy on soil tests, fertilization, selection of seed and painstaking soil preparation, lending every scientific aid to develop the finest peas that can be grown. For it's in the field, and in the field alone, that quality is made. Now with the vines full grown, every safeguard is taken to protect that quality right into the can. Every field must be cut when the peas are just so. Timing counts and how. One hour too early or too late, and that prime quality may be lost forever. Comes the zero hour and harvesting begins. The peas in their pods are just busting their buttons with on-the-minute freshness. There's not an hour to lose, and the mowers move in to capture that June morning flavor right off the vine. There's no twiddling thumbs when nature's the timekeeper. From the minute the field checker gives his go-ahead, it's a race of men and machines against time. It's a chain of many links, this harvest job, each dependent on the other. If only one machine fails, the chain is broken, the whole canning sequence thrown out of stride. When the vines are covered with dew and the pods are crisp and snappy, when the peas are at their peak, that's when the mower goes to town. Hightailing its way down the pea patch, it shears off each vine, like barber clippers on the back of your neck. And then, like a juggler that does a different trick with either hand, rolls them into tidy windrows, ready for the loading crews that follow right behind. With train schedule precision, the loaders follow right on the heels, or rather the clippers, of the mowing machine. Pods are still crisp with dew as that venerable farm tool, the pitchfork, begins hoisting them onto the wagons. Relentlessly, the wagon trains move down the windrows, pitchers on either side holding a steady pace to keep in motion the rhythmic cycle from cutting to canning. There's no stop sign for these men until the wagons are loaded. And if you've never worked on a farm, just try that on your sacroiliac. But maybe this type of pitchfork is more to your liking. Fast mechanical loaders to speed up the harvest on big farms like this. Straddling the rows so as not to injure the pods, it carries its own passport to any spot in the field. Its endless grapplers, gentle as a kitten, pick up the vines, take them for an escalator ride, and toss them lightly onto the load. More and more, Del Monte uses such high-speed equipment to step up the harvest pace to safeguard that distinctive quality Del Monte demands in peas. For Del Monte methods, like Del Monte men, must lead in the march of progress. Loaded now, looking like a parade of gray-green circus elephants, linked trunk to tail, the wagon train lumbers across the fields to the vining station for the next chapter of Pea Progress. Hour after hour, the loaded wagons roll up to the viners, those shiny cylinders that look like aluminum prairie schooners. The vining station is the heartbeat of the harvest, a teeming beehive of men and machinery that does what the housewife used to do by hand, shell the peas. This machine, supplanting slow, costly hand methods, really put America into the pea business in a big way. What happens inside the viner is much the same as if you tossed a pea pod in the air and gave it a firm whack with a flat paddle. Inside the viner, huge paddles, set at just the right angle, smack each mass of falling pods and vines. The air inside each pod is compressed by the blow. The pod bursts open at the seams, and the tender peas burst out, 
just as firm and uninjured as though you had shelled them by hand. And so the harvest job goes on, often through the night. There's only one moment in the life of every pea field when nature says, now's the time to act. And be it dawn or midnight, that's the instant Del Monte men spring into action. Only such vigilance can capture the tenderness and flavor for which the Del Monte label always stands. Short moments away from the harvest fields, the peas arrive at the cannery where they wonder, perhaps, what are these fellows doing? But they'll have to get used to constant inspection. By the time they're ready for the shiny tins at the other end of the cannery, they'll be the most scrutinized peas in the world. Here is the dispatch room that starts the peas over the packing line. From here on, every pea will pass through test after test, elimination after elimination, until at the end, only the very prime peas will have won their spurs for the Del Monte early garden pack. From start to finish, it's every pea for himself, and only the fit survive. Chapter one in the cannery story is the shaker cleaner, a cute gadget with a movement like a rumba dancer, only more of it. The peas dance along until they find a convenient little manhole to drop through, while any pods, stems, or bits of vine get shunted onto a side track. This is just a sort of warmer upper. Those peas ain't seen nothing yet. Now the peas cease to be landlubbers and turn into long distance swimmers. And what a dunking. In the riffle washer, they shoot the chutes in clean, fresh water, so regulated that peas pass over, while heavier matter is trapped in the riffles. Then they get taken for a ride by a spiral conveyor that boosts them along to a rotary washer. Being heavier than water, peas sink to the bottom. Bits of stems, leaves, or skins are skimmed off the top. By now, Mr. and Mrs. P began to think life in a cannery is one long Saturday night. In the rotary washer, they take a scrubbing like a small boy whose folks are expecting company. If peas had ears, this washer would get behind them, and that's no fooling. The next operation gives two things, an elevator ride and a bubble bath. As the peas travel up a pipe conveyor to the top floor of the cannery, the water that carries them is bubbled constantly by a stop-and-go surge of water. Every little pea goes to the top in a billow of foam and gets a shampoo in the bargain. The water separator drains the peas and at the same time eliminates loose skins and broken pieces. Now here's real magic. The Colossus Grader, and what sleight of hand stunts it does. Up to this point, peas of every size are mixed together, like a herd of sheep. But that's no go when you're after flavor. It takes skillful blending of just the right sizes to give that natural June morning taste so characteristic of the early garden blend. No one size or sieve of peas can do it alone. No hit or miss assortment of sizes can do it either. So let's see what goes into the Del Monte Early Garden Blend. These peas sit for their portrait just as they came off the vines, a jumbled collection of mixed up sizes. Many of them just don't have what it takes for Del Monte. So let's put them through the grader and sort them into their respective sizes. Now as peas grow in size, their flavor undergoes marked changes. These two young fellows are weak and watery. Flavor hasn't yet had a chance to develop. So Del Monte says, out you go. As peas approach old age, their sugars change to starch. So these overgrown ones, hard and starchy, their flavor gone, are ruled out too. It's the blending of those in-between sizes that gives the true natural pea flavor. And that's exactly what Del Monte takes for its early garden blend, the pick of the pod. Gee, I guess that's why they taste so good. Why, of course. You know, I can hear my mother now. Feel the pod, son, she'd say. Take just the best ones. So I'd leave those skinny little flat ones that had no flavor, and the big old ones that were hard and starchy, and take just the prime plump ones, like they do at that cannery. Now, were they good? 
Yes, sir. Those peas we had tonight were just like old times. Yes, that's one important keynote to Del Monte flavor. The Colossus Grader, at one fell swoop, unravels those mixed-up sizes and catalogs them for blending. The little ones first, the big ones last. And there you are. So far, so good. Our peas are nicely segregated into proper sizes. But now, another safeguard, the Quality Grader, gives them a double check for prime perfection. In its continuous brine bath, any hard, starchy peas sink to the bottom, like pebbles in a duck pond. The tender sweet ones, being of lighter specific gravity, bob up to the top and travel swiftly on to further proving grounds. Still the elimination race goes on. From the quality grader, the peas travel on to white conveyor belts, where sharp-eyed experts, armed with automatic pickers, are on the alert for broken or discolored peas. This is just one more safeguard to the quality of that early garden blend. After this careful working over, the peas roll off the belt and into hoppers that channel them into the blending blooms. These bring together peas of the selected sizes, not too young, not too old, but just those exactly right in between sizes to produce that natural, delicate, right-off-the-vine flavor. There's no hit or miss, no guesswork in that famous Del Monte pack. When these selected middle sizes come together in the final blend, you get a balance of the finest flavor ever captured from a garden on a dewy June morning. Up to this point, it has been a long series of cold tubs and showers for those fast-traveling peas. Now, in this long cylinder, the blancher, they take their first hot water plunge, winding up a cleaning job that started way back at the other end of the cannery. And then, just as you do in your own shower of a morning, the peas jump under that last cold spray on the shaker washer. By now, every one of those ambitious young peas knows its bend places, and no mistake about it. Comes now the final ordeal. A rigid inspection for broken pieces or discolored specimens. If a pea can get by this gauntlet of sharp-eyed eliminators, it can throw out its chest and say, I am a world champion. I made good. Why all this trouble, all this constant inspection, the careful selection and painstaking elimination? Because Del Monte is determined that any product under its label will be the best that nature, science, men and machines combined can produce. That's the answer. These are the prime peas of the harvest, skillfully blended to produce that succulent right from the garden flavor, uniform in color, uniformly tender, as perfect as nature could make them. It's the last lap now, and those tender peas, like a June morning peeking at you through a window, are lined up at attention, awaiting their turn at the filling machine. Just before the fill, each can gets a cleansing blast of live steam. Canning is a fast tempo climax that happens faster than you can say Del Monte. And the filling machine, little less than human, fills each can at the rapid fire rate of three to the second. Then away they march like an endless parade of proud tin soldiers into the automatic sealer where caps are crimped on and they're ready for the cookers, huge pressure cookers checked and checked again by rigid time and temperature controls. Only a short while before, the peas inside those cans were growing in the fields. In any man's language, that's traveling. Such is the story of Del Monte peas, the story of quality started long before the seeds themselves were planted in the soil, a quality nurtured in the fields by scientific cultivation improved in the cannery by careful selection and exacting supervision, and made available under the famous Del Monte label to housewives everywhere. From field to cannery, it's one continuous cycle of unremitting care, of men, methods, and machines, all dedicated to one ideal, that Del Monte peas shall be none but the pick of the pod.